Hello, everybody. I'm trying to record near my puppies. I, I, uh, I want to take the time to share some of what I've been up to lately. Pamela Redmond here, former Women's Ministry Director at Calvary. And um, we're going to get into God's Word as we've been doing every week here. But I wanted you to see my little, some of what I've been up to. Um, as Gerald announced this past week, I am doing another job now that I actually have been doing for a while. I just, the hours and all of it have kind of picked up. And so um, I, I had to make a decision about um, the future and what uh, I felt the Lord was saying do. And I've, I've had a good run at Calvary as your women's ministry director, and I've had a lot of fun uh, leading you all. But I'm a firm believer in new blood and giving new opportunities for uh, people to serve. And so I guess I'd been thinking about it for a minute. And so when all of a sudden things really started picking up my other job, it it seemed like the right time, you know, to, to kind of go. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to be around to encourage and love on y'all just as hopefully you feel I've been doing sufficiently up to now. I just want to introduce you to my little friend here <laughs> on cue. Wow. This is Aurora and my uh, dog, my, I have two poodles and they had puppies during COVID, which has been so fun and amazing. And um, I just really enjoyed taking some quiet time with this one. And so I wanted to share that because I felt like it kind of went along with what we're going to talk about today. Um, the, if you're following along in the book, the book, the chapter that we're on has the title of a Langston Hughes poem, which says, my life ain't been no crystal stair. And it talks about how a mother basically is speaking to her son. And she's talking about how life has not always been good. It's been full of trials and, and various things. And that in spite of that, she's kept moving. She's kept moving along and things have still happened, ha you know, started to happen for her. And she's still here, basically. She has been able to keep moving and move along in her life and in positivity. And she hasn't quit when things have gotten hard. She's pressed and she's, she's kept, you know, the you know, kept believing that she could and she kept moving forward. And so she's encouraging her son to do the same. And uh, Christy, I think she's the one that wrote this chapter. She says, the poem expresses a mother's difficult life yet offers hope that our hardships don't have the last word. The landings reached and the corners turned and the final destination are head ahead are worth the pain and scars of climbing. And then she says, how might Christians persevere through hardships like those she faced? We know Langston Hughes is an African-American author. So we can imagine uh, the mom is talking, she doesn't specify, but she's talking about a variety of things such as poverty, maybe even slavery, or um, you know, just enduring uh, racist talk towards her or, you know, just any manner of thing being mistreated um, in, in her life. And it says, um, this passage will help us answer the question is how, how is a Christian going to endure hardships like the ones that she could have faced? It says it beckons us up the stairway of life to the place where the Lord sits enthroned and reigning forever. And uh, 
I just want to open us in a word of prayer and then uh, we'll get right into the passage. Um, um, and, and I'm just teasing you a little bit, you know, how do we endure difficulty? Do we follow the path of the poet here by just climbing, climbing, climbing? And, and does, do we like the boy follow the example of, of those that we've seen pressing ahead? Or, or how does this passage compare and contrast to that? So let's just pray and read the passage and then take a little closer look. Dear Lord, we thank you that your word stands firm forever, that um, because of your endurance, Lord God, because of your um, instructions to us, we're able to look at our lives and, and make determinations by comparing what we're doing to what you have laid out and shown us to do, uh, we can know with certainty that we're on the right path, that we're following your statutes, or whether we need to make adjustments. Lord, help us to uh, have that posture as we come before you today, Lord God, just quieting our hearts, listening for you, and uh, trying to understand what you're trying to say to us in our various circumstances. Lord, I don't know what all those circumstances are that our ladies, many ladies are facing. I'm sure they're varied and, um, you know, and, and just with COVID too complicated. Um, Lord, I pray that you would be with them, that you give them quiet moments uh, like the one I'm taking right now to just enjoy being in your presence and understanding you. Uh, just give us great understanding, I pray, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I want us to look at the passage and I want us to ask ourselves this question. And that is, you know, the writer says that they are still moving despite the difficulties that would the, what Langston Hughes writes in his poem. Because of the example, the boy should keep moving on towards bigger and better things, following his mother's example. And I feel like that is part of what we're seeing in this section of the scriptures, which we're about to read uh, here. But I also think that there is a contrast to what she is saying in here as well. So let's just read the passage and, and then we'll, we'll talk about what I mean. So we're starting in Psalm 119, verse 89. And it says, forever, O Lord, your word is fixed firmly in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You've established the earth and it stands fast, but your by your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. So I say similar, similarly, but also in contrast, the psalmist says he sees that there is something he must emulate as well, something that is to be an example to him, not necessarily to keep moving, but to know that whatever comes his way, he can look to his God who stands forever. He stands firm forever. His word stands firm forever. We shall not be moved or conquered or vanquished or destroyed. We shall not be moved and ultimately will be the only thing left standing. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God stands forever. And you're wondering, where did you get that from, Pam? How did you, 
get that from what you see here. Okay, well, let's take a look. Because he starts out in the beginning by saying, forever, O Lord, your word is fixed firmly in the heavens. We know that the word says that uh, Jesus, God, the, the Trinity said, let there be light and there was light. And there has never ceased to be light from the time that it was spoken. God's word has a longevity to it. His word, his spoken word, there's power in it. And when he says it, it stands forever. Um, and that is true of uh, what all of scripture says about the things spoken by God. Even Jesus says, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The things that he said from the very beginning, he's come to make sure they come to pass. So his word is true and it's not waffling, it's not changing, it is long standing. Uh, because he stands, we know that we who are his will also stand. So we look to God, we see his word standing forever, and we see it standing in a variety of ways. Let's look at the scriptures just a little bit closer, the part that we just read. He said, your word is fixed firmly in the heavens. When you look in the heavens, what do you see? You see stars, you see clouds, you see the sun sometimes, the moon. And guess what? If you look 10 years from now, or you look 10 years ago, if you remember, have a memory of being outside at some point in your life, 10 years ago, and you looked in the sky, you saw the sun, you saw the moon, you saw stars. And all the things that we see are the things that we continually see. His word in the heavens is very consistent and very steady. We never wake up in the morning and say, is the sun going to rise today? I mean, yeah, clouds might hide the sun, but it's never going to be so cold that we can't survive, right? I mean, the faithfulness of the heavens is proof that our Lord stands forever. That's one thing that we see here. But it also says, your faithfulness endures to all generations. Um, this is spoken of in some of the New Testament passages that say all the way up until the time when Christ returns, will be given and each other in marriage. There'll be marriage, there'll be babies being born, there'll be life continuing because God has said from the garden by his word, be fruitful and multiply. So it says it endures to all generations. We see generation after generation continually con going on and on is a sign of the faithfulness and the steadfastness and the unchangeableness of something that has been put in play by God's word. And it says, you have established the earth and it stands fast. Yes, we have earthquakes. Yes, we have storms. Yes, we have fires. But the earth is pretty much the same as it's been. There's global warming. There's, there's a lot of different things. But the earth in and of itself, by its longevity, it is showing a a, a consistency of uh, a truth that is true of our God. It says, by your appointment, they stand this day for all things are your servants. If ever something were trag tragic to happen so that something is no more, even that is God's doing. Um, and so then we see the psalmist moving into another section where he compares his ability to stand in the face of his enemies as being a direct result of him tapping into the longevity that is the word of God. We see that in verse, in verse 
hold on, 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Up to now, we've been talking about faithfulness and endurance and things that don't end. But when we start talking about what will happen, if we separate ourselves from God's word, he said, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished. This is the first place in the Psalm so far where we see talk of perishing, of death, of something ending. If he had separated himself from the word of God, he would have ended. He would have perished. He would have perished in his affliction. So we see even from saying perished in my affliction is that longevity does not mean that we do not suffer affliction. Remember our our poem at the beginning, my life ain't been no crystal stair. It doesn't have to be a crystal stair in order for us to endure, but we can endure as long as we are making the Lord and his word, his law, our delight. That is what will keep us from perishing. He says, I will never forget your precepts for by them you have given me life not only is longevity something that comes as a result of clinging to god's word it's life longevity can imply that we're just holding on by a thread but when you say that we have life you're talking about something that is living and breathing and exciting and growing like this puppy, right? He has life, you know? And as he grows every day, he becomes more and more alive. He runs around more and, and plays and, and does more than just lay in the corner and sleep like he did when he was a baby, baby, baby. I'm going to put him down now because he's He's acting like he wants me to put him down. So hold on. So we see that as we cling to God's word and we cling to the one who has longevity and life in his hands, we will have longevity and life. It is by our identifying with God and holding fast to God that we have life and that we have uh, a confidence that even when we are afflicted, we will not perish because God will keep us from perishing and he allows us to tap into that longevity and steadfast property that is his person, it's in his character, it's in his word. Because he stands, we know that we who are his will also stand. The longevity, the staying power of the one who holds the whole earth together, who causes the sun to rise and set, who causes the seasons to come and go in faithfulness will faithfully hold us firm, not allowing us to perish. We, like the boy in the, in the poem, we, like the boy in the poem, we have uh, an example to, to hold on to. We have the ability to tap into God and his goodness. He talks about the heavens and the generations, we've touched on that, and the earth being here forever. He talks about the law and its righteous rules being his delight, and that being something that keeps him from perishing. In contrast, he says to the wicked, and that's the next section. He says, I'm yours, save me, for I've sought your precepts. In verse 95, he says, the wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. In other words, destruction is something that would threaten us, 
and would even frighten us if it weren't for our consideration and trust in the testimonies of God. And uh, his testimonies last forever. They are unending. Uh, we've seen, we know the scripture that says, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. As we stand with God's word, we, we basically take on the character of his word and we develop that, that longevity, that, that um, keeping power. And God gives us his spirit, which is the spirit that raised him from the dead so that we do not have to worry about perishing. Our example is Christ, ultimately. He was not thwarted by the things that came at him when he was a human here on the earth. He had adversaries, just like we have adversaries. The Sadducees and the Pharisees challenged him often. He had people that were plotting to kill him. He did not flee the pain of the cross. And this is where I say uh, the psalmist or the, the, the writer Langston Hughes says, life hasn't been a crystal stair. Well, Christ's life was not a crystal stair either. I don't, and he pressed on. It says that he endured the cross, despising the shame. And as a result, he now sits on the right hand of God the Father. But in the meantime, what did his pressing look like? His pressing look like him hanging on a cross quietly while he wrought for us our salvation. It wasn't a stairway for him to climb. It was a pain that he had to endure while he was still. This is an interesting concept, I think that we have to learn discernment from God when it is that we are to press like up that crystal stair, press our way, and when it's time to just sit back in the cut and rest and endure without action, but with prayer which is action, but it is an action that looks as though it is not moving. There's a song that says, I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. And I think of that, I thought of that when I was doing this study, I thought, there is the pressing up the stair that is very visible. And then there's also this sense in which you sit back in the cut and you pray and you're quiet and you're unmovable, as the scripture says. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work shall not be in vain. Sometimes that's sitting, sometimes that's moving. And just being able to discern which is what I, I hope to bring home here. Jesus hung on the cross with no movement. He asked for drink, but he hung. He couldn't move. He was nailed. He could not move. He could not move up a stair. He could not do anything. He just hung. He hung there until our salvation was accomplished. I think there's a lesson for us here, especially in light of all the turmoil in our world today, is that true believers 
don't always need to take matters into their own hands. Sometimes it's best to sit, to pray, to watch and pray and let the Lord fight our battles. We don't need to be frantic. We don't need to be running amok or trying to figure out things. Sometimes we can just be peaceful and wait. I think this is one of the strengths that I really find key. And I'm going to speak very personally here as an African American woman, as my Friend Sharita mentioned, you know, I, I try not to put, she said we should not put the parts of ourselves on a shelf. Like as a Christian, I should not have to put the fact that I'm an African-American woman on a shelf in order to minister or in order to function in the world that the way that God has made me is unique and the way that he has made me is uh, something that I should not have to conform to be something other than what I am, as long as we're not talking about me walking in sin. And so I, I find it great, greatly comforting to me to know that as an African-American, my people, have not often done what we saw done in, uh, you know, we have not rushed the Capitol. I mean, there have been times in despair when people have risen up and rioted or done things unseemly. I'm not saying in contrast that nothing unseemly has ever been done, but I wanna say that as a people for the thousands of years that things have happened uh, we have found ways to navigate in our faith, those of us that are strong believers, in a quiet way to go to God and to let him fight so many battles. Um, I think that that is, is something that um, is, is beautiful about my culture. Um, I know that there are a lot of things that have happened that have not been beautiful about that. You know, I'm not condoning rioting or anything of that sort. Uh, but I am saying that as a whole, for the length of years when there have been obvious mistreatments and disparities in even the way law enforcement, which was shown forth uh, of late, um, that still for the majority of the time, there's been a quiet functioning of going to God. Uh, I know that's how I've been raised in my family, that that's the way things run have run in my family. But anyway, I digress. I'm not trying to be controversial at all, but I'm just saying that I love that we're still here despite a lot more opposition that we've gotten than we've given. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. The psalmist lastly says, he's talked about the wicked lying in wait and how they want to destroy him, but in, you know, rather than taking matters into his own hands and trying to retaliate, he considers the testimonies of God and meditates on those, prays on those and finds comfort in just sitting still. And, um, he contrasts what they're doing to him. They're lying in wait to destroy him. They're busy, busy acting. And then he says, but I consider your testimonies. 
And then lastly, the last verse, he says, he continues the same vein. He says, I have seen a limit to all perfection. In other words, even those things that I see in life that are beautiful and wonderful to me, none of them are as wonderful or as long lived or as long to be enjoyed as God's word. There's nothing that is more enduring than the word of God or his commandments. Look at what he says. He says, I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Like even the things that I have seen that would by man's standards be considered perfect, his commandment is even broader and bigger than that. Think of all the things that would delight you that you would say, oh, wow, that was so perfect. Think about, say, uh, a wedding that you've gone to. I've been to a lot of weddings, being a pastor's wife, and I, there's some that really still even stick out in my mind. The decorations were incredible. The, the way that everything kind of flowed together was incredible. There were things that, you know, the food was incredible. The cake was out of this world. They were perfect and it was just so wonderful. I think about fellowships that I've had with family and friends, times and memories that stick out, family gatherings. I know, you know, those of you that have family reunions, you can think, oh, wow, we had so much fun and I hadn't seen cousin so-and-so in so long and we hung out and it was such a good, warm feeling. Um, Eric had an aunt that passed away a couple of Christmases ago. And so uh, some of the family had hung out long, you know, we went to Florida for Christmas that year. So we had already been having a great time. And then we got the bad news about an aunt who died. And it was very sad. Um, but the funeral itself was so amazing because so many of us had not seen each other for so long. And it was just a great opportunity to, to see one another. It was a bittersweet time. We were sorry that um, our aunt had passed, but we were so glad to be together. We just took so many pictures together and it just felt so wonderful. It was just a great feeling. And I know if you all sit and think for a while, you can think of gatherings like this. You can think of a time, an intimacy time when you and your spouse was first getting to know each other or, you know, think of when you were young and, you know, you had first love or if you were getting a pet for the first time or, or the thrill even of having a, a, new, a new puppy or as I've had and just the joy of these things of, you know, the child being born um, the joy of a child who's delighting in something and you're caught up in the magic of seeing them experience things for a new time. All of these, I think, would fall under what the psalmist is calling here um, perfection. The perfections that we see. A really good worship service where you go and the spirit is high and there's lots of good singing and your spirit is moved by uh, feeling close to God. Communion, what communion is like, you know, when all the saints are gathered and what, what a joy that's gonna be for us. How perfect that's gonna feel when COVID is over and we're able to experience that again together. If you're like me, you're thinking, wow, I can hardly wait until we're able to engage and in a worship service with lots of other people again. That's things that we think of and we long for them. In a, in a, we want them as if we are desiring a piece of heaven. And the psalmist is quick to say, I've seen limit to all perfection all of these things that we desire, all of these things that would be the ultimate for us on earth still have limits. 
compared to the commandments of God. The delight that the psalmist is saying can be experienced by deeply partaking of and aligning ourselves with and becoming a part of God's word, both by our understanding of it, by our enjoyment of it, and the peace of it, the quiet of it, that it is much broader than anything we can ever imagine. And it is something that will keep us in the same way that God's word stands firm, we will be able to stand firm in the midst of difficulty because of our connection to God's word. So yes, life has not been a crystal stair. And yes, we need to keep pressing but there are times when we must align ourselves with and drink in and hold fast to that which is the only steadfast thing, and that is God and his word. Let us pray. Dear God, I'm just so thankful that by your faithfulness to us, by showing us things on the earth, by showing us things in the heavens, by showing us things in your word that are never changing, you encourage us to trust you and to hold fast to you and to know that there is nothing else in this world that is able to have the longevity and the keeping power that your word does. Lord, I thank you that by your word, you brought the world into existence. I thank you that by your world, by your word, Christ holds all things together. And that if he's able to do that, Lord, help us to make the necessary uh, logical, thought process, that if you can do all of that, if you can hold the world together, if you can hold the heavens, if you can hold your word and make it so it never fails and is, has no error in it at all, that you are able to keep us. You are able to keep us and hold us fast in the midst of enemies, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of troubling times. And that even if we are removed from here, even if the things that we most enjoy disappear, Lord, we know ultimately that because your word stands firm and it says that we shall one day see you as you are and we shall be like you, that we have the hope that we shall not be moved and if removed from this life, that we shall be with you forever and longevity in the next. Lord, help this to be an encouragement to someone. Help them to apply this to their lives in some area where maybe their minds were spiraling out of control, thinking wild thoughts about something in anxiety. Help their thoughts to be taken captive by the understanding that you stand with us, you hold us, and you will be holding us forever. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, ladies. I hope to see you soon.